that most dramatic of natural phenomena, lightning. Scientists have been trying to understand lightning for many years. I suppose the father of lightning studies was Benjamin Franklin. He started his electrostatic investigations by looking at the effects of points on charged objects. I can show those effects using this Van de Graaff generator. Remember, when I turn the belt, the top will become charged. There will be a potential difference between it and the base. You can see the potential difference on this meter. There we are. 10 kilovolts, top of the scale. I can discharge the top by bringing my hand close to it. Ouch. <laughs> Hope I don't have to repeat that experiment. Now, watch what happens when I charge the top again. And this time, bring towards it a sharply pointed object, a needle. Here it goes. This time, the top discharges quietly, without a spark. The point appears to draw the charge from the top. Now, Franklin was intrigued by observations such as these, and he became convinced that he could prove that thunderclouds were charged by drawing charge from them using a long pointed pole, or as here, by drawing the charge along a string hoisted aloft by a kite. Both experiments worked. And what Franklin and his contemporaries managed to show by them was that lightning was just another electrical phenomenon to be explained in much the same terms as electrical phenomena seen here in the laboratory. This paved the way for the lightning conductor. In this program, we're going to look at the modern explanation of lightning. And while doing so, we can introduce an important phenomenon in electrostatics, the shaping of electric fields by pointed objects. Well, for lightning, you usually need a thundercloud. So let's start by looking at how these clouds develop. If the atmosphere contains cold air at high altitude and moist warm air at lower levels, then the warm air will rise on a strong convection current. As it rises, it expands and cools, and condensation produces a cloud. This fairly typical cloud is about 12 kilometers deep, and so there's a large temperature difference between the top and the bottom, and this maintains the convection and the turbulence. Large hailstones forming at the top fall through ice, snow, and rain lower down. And this relative motion provides a mechanism by which the cloud may charge up. We'll follow an individual hailstone as it falls through the cloud, keeping it in the middle of the picture. You'll see later that an electric field always exists above the surface of the Earth. And in this field, induced charges will appear on the hailstone. As it falls, it overtakes smaller ice crystals and occasionally there'll be a collision. Some of the charge on the lower part of the hailstone will be transferred to and carried away by the smaller ice crystal. The increasing separation of the two lumps of ice reinforces the electric field that's already there. As this process is repeated many, many times, the cloud acquires a net positive charge at the top and a net negative charge at the bottom. Typically, there might be 30 or 40 coulombs of separated charge in a fully developed cloud. Of course, the actual process is a complicated one, and it's quite common to find a small pocket of positive charge somewhere near the bottom of the cloud, perhaps carried there by a convection current. This is one of the most likely mechanisms of charge separation, but similar processes can occur whenever there are convection currents carrying particles in the atmosphere. For example, the relative motion of the dust particles produced by a volcanic explosion can also result in charge separation. 
there was a lot of electrical activity in the atmosphere when the new island of Surtsey erupted from the sea near Iceland. And similar lightning was seen more recently during the Mount St. Helens eruption. The presence of the electrical dipole in the fully developed cloud enormously enhances the electric field in the area around the cloud. And this field induces a positive charge on the ground beneath the cloud. It isn't easy to get instruments to give reliable readings inside thunderclouds. But by monitoring the induced field at the ground, we can deduce quite a lot about what is happening in the cloud. I've got some nice evidence for the relationship between electric fields at the ground and charge separation up in clouds in this trace. It's part of a record made by John Chubb at his home in Landudno in North Wales. He measured the vertical component of the electric field that's plotted along this axis between 5 o'clock one Monday evening and 1 o'clock the following morning. During the first few hours, the weather was fine, and the electric field is small in magnitude. The positive sign means that the electric field was directed downwards. At about 8 o'clock, it started to rain, and the electric field increased markedly in magnitude. Now, I can't pretend I can explain all the details of this trace. These positive going pulses here, for example, I can't explain. But what I can say is that, at this point, the electric field has reversed in sign. It's become negative. And that's consistent with charge separation taking place in the clouds negative charge accumulating in the base. At about 11 o'clock, the rain stopped. And that means the charge separation mechanism stopped. And the electric field fell back down again to its previous value. Now, if we've been lucky enough to catch a thunderstorm, we might well have recorded an electric field magnitude of 0.1 kilovolts per centimeter. We weren't quite so lucky. It was just heavy rain. And we recorded a rather smaller value. But I think you'd agree, from this trace, there's persuasive evidence for charge separation in clouds. So, we've discovered that during lightning storms, the field at the surface of the Earth is of order 0.1 kilovolts per centimetre. Knowing this, it's not too difficult to work out approximately what the magnitude of the field must be inside the cloud. And it turns out that 1 kilovolt per centimetre is a fairly typical value. The question is, is this enough to cause the lightning flash? Will a field of one kilovolt per centimetre make the air conduct, make it break down? 